Good morning, Saints. Well, since the hour is at hand for us to once again sit down and have another wonderful time with Sunday school, let's stand to our feet and we'll have a word of prayer and we'll see how the Spirit moves us this morning in this lesson that has been placed before us. So shall we pray? Father, it's once again at this hour and once again at this time that we come to you as always as humble as we can. Thank you once again, dear Lord, for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us from yet one week until the next. And now, dear Lord, as we come together to study upon this word, we ask as always that your spirit would truly be in the midst of it all. We ask, dear Lord, that you will place upon us all some knowledge, some wisdom, some understanding and guidance about this word that we may interpret it in the way that you would have for it to go. Bless those that are here, dear Lord, and those that are still on their way. For it's in Jesus' name we give this prayer. Amen. Well, once again, good morning to everyone. Today we are embarking upon our last lesson that we have for our spring quarter. And with the spring quarter now coming to an end, you know how I started to do this class this morning? I said, we need to have a review quiz. Now, oh, that's what I said. Now, let me tell you why I said that. We need a review quiz. Uh, because of a review quiz really, though, on one lesson. And that was on the lesson of Thursday night. Okay. Oh, you, oh, you went on there. What? On Thursday night. And the reason why, glad you brought that up, Helen, because, you know, when we teach virtually, I'm not a, a big fan of using, uh, for me, using the virtual, you know, the Zoom or uh, go-to meeting. I mean, it's a good tool to have, but just for me presenting it, it's difficult talking to a, a laptop. Because as I said before, when I uh, present the lesson, I have, like today, I have notes on this side. I have the Sunday school over here. I have my Bible translation going here. And then in the background, I don't really see go-to meeting. I just had the top of this screen going so I can make sure that I'm still online and have you know, disconnected. I can also um, see if anybody sends me a message, like maybe a sound has gone out that can go on. But I also can see those who have logged in, you know, like, like the number of people. So... When the lesson came up, I normally turn it on about uh, 10 minutes to 7, 5 minutes to 7. So I had the lesson going. I got all prepared to get the introduction straight. And as I sat there, I was looking at it. I said, okay, they can be logging on in a minute. It was 7.56. I said, they're coming. It was 7.57. I said, they're coming. Then all of a sudden, ding. I said, uh-oh, call a one. Here they come. No, I said, here they come. Seven o'clock, here they come. I said, okay, it was me and caller one. As the lesson got on the way a little bit further, I get another ding, okay, got another one on. And that was it. I said, I guess what, I'm going to get all of them. I'm going to give them a test on this very lesson. But then I said, well, let me change my mind on that. I said, they may be like I am. Things come up. You got to do different things. Uh, vacation time's going on, you're busy doing this and that. So things do happen, and we understand that. I said, I hope it's not a case of, they said, when I see them on Sunday, I don't need to see them during the week. I hope that's not the case, because guess what? I hope y'all don't fire me, but we out of town again next week, or this week coming up. So unless, let's say, Diggin' Bush or, uh, or Diggin' Hall want to volunteer, I'm going to do it again virtually. So this Thursday, we'll be having Sunday school once again, unless something changes between now and then. Uh, but like I said, unfortunately, uh, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but we'll be out of town this coming Sunday also. So therefore, we'll not have Sunday school in-house next week. Okay, so don't fire me. I'm coming back. But we will um, have Sunday school Thursday night um, dealing with the, the lesson that's coming about. And as stated, you know, next week, we are starting a new series of lessons. Uh, momentarily, we'll pass the books out um, for our next summer quarter coming up. But just to give you a little bit of insight into where we're going, um, next quarter we're dealing with Jesus Proclaims the Kingdom. It's 13 lessons of dealing with Jesus Proclaims the Kingdom. And in the first unit, it deals with understanding the kingdom, which is a good way to start out. Because if Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom, you have to understand what he's talking about and what the kingdom deals with. So our first four lessons deals with um, understanding the kingdom itself. We have 13 lessons as always, and all of them are only coming out of one section of the Bible, and that is a section known as the Synoptic Gospels. And as we know, the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So those are the only three books we'll be using all summer long as we go forward. But until we get to that point, we have today's lesson to finish out. And today's lesson 
is coming out of John, the 17th chapter, starting at verse 6. And it's entitled, Jesus Prays for Believers. Now, when you read that title, Jesus Prays for Believers, it can be somewhat misleading because initially you're thinking of Jesus just praying for those who believe. And Jesus is praying here, but this prayer takes on really three different phases. And what I mean by three different phases is the first part of the lesson, which is not our printed text, the first few verses, Jesus prays, guess who, for himself. And there's nothing wrong with praying for yourself, is it? I mean, if nobody else is going to pray for you, at least there's enough sense that Wallace said pray for yourself. That's the key thing. Then our lesson deals with Jesus then praying for his apostles. And then later it deals with Jesus' prayer for everybody. So when he said Jesus prays for believers, yes, he's praying for believers, but it's broken down really into three separate phases there. And to start off with a question, to get things going here, um, there's a set of scriptures. I'm actually, well, what they call these scriptures, see if we're on the same page. When you hear the words, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What do we typically call that? The Lord's Prayer? Do we call it anything else? I hear the model prayer. Anything else? You know I'm going to mess with you. <laughs> it's a prayer in a session. Mm -hmm. Talk to your father. Yeah, but typically you'll find with that prayer, it is typically called, as I get this thing hooked up in me right, it's typically called the Lord's Prayer. That's what we call it. But in actuality, it is the Lord praying, but it's not really the Lord's prayer, as we're so accustomed to being called. Uh, you'll find this prayer, I think it's in Matthew, the sixth chapter, when Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, which is chapters five, six, and seven. And then you also you'll find those words in the gospel according to Luke. Uh, but in Luke's gospel, it tells you how the disciples told Jesus, teach us how to pray. As John, talking about the baptized, or John the Baptist, taught his disciples. And Jesus said, when you pray, you pray in this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven. So that prayer is really was called the model prayer. Otherwise, it's what you model your prayers after. The Lord's Prayer is what we're dealing with today. So if anybody asks you about the Lord's Prayer, you tell them John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. When you're dealing with Matthew and Luke, that's actually the model prayer. But we've been taught over the years it's the Lord's Prayer. I always say, well, it's the Lord's praying, but actually it's just the model prayer. Today we're dealing with the Lord's Prayer himself with Jesus praise. This prayer and actually still doing the same timeline as most of our lessons dealt with. You remember how we dealt with how Judas now betrayed Christ and Christ said, what thou doest, doest thou quickly. And then Judas leaves to go and gather up the... Uh, the officials and the scribes and the Pharisees and all those folks to arrest Jesus. And they said, and they sing a hymn and they went unto the Mount of Olives. Remember they prayed and all, but be in between those events, this takes place. But that's the key thing about it. You have to read the gospels to get it all together. Cause one would just say after he left, they sang a hymn, they went and that was it. But you no, know, you find many things went on such as what we have today. And also last week lesson, which dealt with Thursday night, which the true vine that all took place too. This is all part of what's known in John's gospel as the upper room discourses. In other words, the events that took place while they were doing the Passover meal, which was instituted the Holy Communion as we have today. So this took place pretty much during that same timeline. But as we open up this morning, Jesus starts out, as we said in the very beginning, praying for who? Praying for himself. And nothing wrong with praying for yourself. And after he gives those words of praying for yourself, he starts off by saying, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. To start off on a slower pace, the word I. Somebody said, oh, he hit the first word and he stopped. And this will be a long lesson. But now it's very important. Remember he prayed for self starting out? But then he says, I have manifested thy name. He's here until he's making a statement of what it is that he has done. In other words, he's making a statement not to lift up self or brag about self, but he's basically saying to God, I have done what it is you have called for me to do. So this is what it is I have done. Once again, he's not lifting up himself. He's not talking about himself. He's not bragging about himself. He's just making a statement to his father in prayer, in communication that I have did the things that you had called for me to do. Because keep in mind, this is a deep prayer that's leading into a deeper prayer when he gets into the garden. Because at this point, who's coming after him? Hmm? 
No, Satan's coming, but who's coming after you? The Roman soldiers, Jesus knows that he's going to betray him, and at any moment they're going to come to arrest him to have him crucified. So basically now he's just praying to his father, saying he's pretty much given, the, uh, you could say, his closing statement that the work is pretty much almost finished, that he was called for. So he says, I have manifested that name. So he's saying in there, this is a statement I've given. And when he says, I have manifested that name, manifest means to do what? When someone says manifest, you see it often in the Bible. What do you mean by I have manifest thy name or just manifest itself? Manifest means lift it up. It means to proclaim. It means to promote. Uh, it means to declare. In other words, I have now presented your name to your people. But it means more than just his name. It's not talking about just Jehovah or Yahweh or Elohim. What he meant is he has now lifted up who God is, what God is about, his character and all these things through these men that you have gave me. Now, some have said the question, say, why do he need to lift up his name to a series of people that already know him? There you go, Gigi, you got it right. A lot of people, you could say, know of God, but they don't have knowledge of God. Now, I'm not saying that these individuals are setting that place, because keep in mind, this message really transcends to everyone. But you'll find that the children of Israel, oh, they had an understanding and knew who God was, but didn't have knowledge of him. Because if they truly had knowledge of God, would they be doing the things that they were doing? If they knew the power of God and who he was, would they be worshiping idols? If they knew the power and knowledge of God and who he was, would they be ready now to crucify his son? If they knew the, uh, had the knowledge and power of God, would they be, uh, what they call them, defrauding widows? Otherwise, the list goes on and on of the evils and the sins that they were doing, but yet they said they had knowledge of God. It shows us that they did not have true knowledge of God. You know, as the pastor said, a lot of people have head knowledge. In other words, they know who God is, but they don't have knowledge of who he is. You know, I said this last week in the lesson to kind of drive it home, give you a few examples. Just because you read a book don't mean that you're a philosopher. You know, uh, I said just because you own a water hose, that don't make you a fireman. Just because you like donuts. That don't make you a police officer. And just because you go to church, that don't mean you're a believer. Because a whole lot of people, guess what? Go to church. But are they truly knowledgeable of God's word and know who God is? So Jesus now is letting his men know who God is, and they have accepted the knowledge and understanding of who he is. And this is what he means by he says, I have manifested thy name. In other words, I have lifted up who you are to these men. And he says, to the men which thou gavest me out of the world. He said, the men which thou gavest me. And we know God has given him these men because in the gospel, he talks about how Jesus had went to the mountain. And remember, he said, he prayed. I'll be the word said all that night. And then he said, early that morning, he called unto him his disciples. Now, when he says disciples, we know disciples are students. They are learners. They are truly followers of God. And when oftentimes in the Bible, we look at the word disciples, we think of just the 12. And was the 12 are singled out and they're listed out because, you know, um, it shows how they were called, you know, they were fishing at one point. One was sitting at the money changers tables. Some were under a tree and so on from there. But a lot of times in the Bible, when it says disciples, it's not talking of the 12. It's talking about all the believers who believe in him. Because when you read that scripture, you have to catch it. It's very quick. He say, call unto him his disciples. And then it says, of them, he picked 12. So let's know there was more than the 12 the entire time. It was like John the Baptist had many disciples also. But it says of these 12 he picked, he said he ordained. In other words, he installed, he consecrated, he put into office, he set aside. He appointed these men to be his ambassadors, envoys. One would take his message and carry it abroad. Therefore, they were now called apostles. They were more than that of disciples. And he said, these are the men which thou gavest me. So we know what these men are. But the part I like, he said, which thou gavest me out of the world. A lot can be said about out of the world. Anybody know why he would use that phrase? These are the men you gave me out of the world. Let me just see what you think about this phrase. What do you mean by that? These are the men you gave me out of, the key part is the world. What will you draw from that? Digging Bush? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
You're exactly, exactly correct about that. When he said, I chose them out of the world. Because keep in mind, we're all in the world, aren't we? But just because we're in the world don't mean we're of the world, but we're placed here to save, as God would say, the world itself. And you would think there that when he said, chose men out of the world, we would think that, or we look at it more of a church sense, that those in the church are not in the world. So you would think that, well, who he would have picked? Why not the lawyers? We know them better as the term scribes. Think about it. They know the scriptures, right? These are key individuals. They have knowledge. They have understanding of the scriptures, nor like none other. You would think he would have chose those individuals. Or some would say, well, why not the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees were the most respected in the community. Everybody looked up to them for their knowledge, for their understanding, for their strict adherence to the laws. These were the ideal ones to perhaps even pick. And they were not supposedly part of the world. But what does God do? He does things a little bit differently. Because you'll find that the scribes and Pharisees, I like to say, they were up here. Now, God could have made them greater. But God normally takes what? Those are down here and makes them even greater. He chose 12 individuals that had no knowledge uh, or formal education in the word as these people I just mentioned. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were tent makers and things of that nature. But God chose these individuals from out of the world, just average folks who he educated or Christ educated to be yet his apostles to go forth. Could have chose anyone, but yet he chose these individuals to be because they were distinctly, you could say, different than these uh, so-called elite and the educated ones. So he could, like I said, pull anybody he want, but he doesn't choose anyone. But he chose these distinct individuals to lead the way. And these are the ones that he called, it says, out of the world. He says, then thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So he says here, first they were whose? Who did he belong to? God. And God gave them to who? To him. And they did what? They kept this word. Let me explain this one this way. <clears throat> Ask you a series of questions. Now, I'm asking these questions because I want you to hear what it is that's coming out of your mouth, okay? Because we believe ourselves better when we say it, right? Unless we're telling a lie. But then again, some of us can, can believe our own lies, can't we? <laughs> but let me ask you a question. If you, if you gave somebody something, who does it now belongs to? Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? All right? If somebody gives you something, who does it belong to? You're 100% correct. Here's the next one. And, and, and I'm not trying to throw you here, but here's the next one. Okay, if you gave somebody something and you said it's now theirs, right? What can they do with it? Anything they want, right? Okay, all right. Remember what you said. I want you to understand it. Somebody now gives you something. What can you do with it? Anything you want. I buy that. And that should be the way it should be, right? It should be that way. If they've, somebody gave you something, it's now yours to do what it is you like to do with it. You know, uh, one of the best examples I've heard of this was, this story is now based upon a true story. I'm going to say it that way so I don't get no names out. But it's based upon a true story. Family member, a uh, family basically had a, a loved one who passed away. And when they passed away, you'll find that they left all that they own to one of the family members, okay? All they had, they left to one family member. Um, and sometimes that is an ideal thing to do. You know, like uh, I've been discussing with people before at a house. You know, let the house to one person. To me, that's a good thing to do. I mean, what was the house? You can imagine what happened you give a house to 20 people. You know, and people do that, and it's, it's total chaos, but that's a whole other story. But anyway, they left everything to this one individual. They gave it to that person, right? Of course, when they gave this person, what do you think happened next? Because they had other siblings. What happened next? <laughs> oh, y'all y'all been there, haven't y'all? <laughs> gave it to the argument breaks out. Now, who are they mad with? The person that got everything. Now, keep in mind, it was given to you, and you're mad at who? 
want to give them to him. Wait a minute, you need to go see the one up there at Rose Lawn. You follow me? They're the ones that gave it to you. Well, that remains live there, put it that way. But you'll find they're mad at this person because everything was given to them. Now, mind you, they had nothing to do with it. It just said, hey, I, he left it or she left it all to this person here. When we left it to that person and everybody was arguing about it, a couple of key things happened. What they didn't realize was that person had no problem with this. That person said, I just want you guys to know that I'm going to share it with everybody. But, you know, even though he said that, one came out of nowhere and said, you can't do that. Now, Bryn said, hmm. Here's why they said that, because they said, that person who gave this to you, this was their, they called their last wish or dying wish, that you have all their possessions. I get that. That was their last wish for you to have it. You know what that person says? But yeah, they gave it to me. And when they gave it to me, it's now mine that I can do whatever it is I want with it. So my desire is to share it with everybody. Now, how this all comes together is that when you decide to share it with everybody, their goal and desire was that, um, I guess you could say it would bring peace. But what they wanted to realize was that by sharing it with everybody, that was my wish, that was their desire. Now, when you look at it from the, the bigger picture, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, they were basically saying that the expectation is when somebody gives you something, it's yours to do whatever you want. But still, there's an expectation that you can do the right thing with it. Okay? It's like somebody, you know, we all seen somebody give somebody something and they sell it immediately. And the person that gave it to him said, I know I gave it to you, but I knew you were going to sell it. I could have sold it myself and kept the money. But the expectation is that even though I give it to you, you can do what you want. There's a level of respect that you would do the right thing by it. Here, God is now giving Jesus these men. And Jesus says that um, thine they were, and thou gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. So in other words, when you just thought about I have manifested thy name, he's shown them that what you have given unto me, I use it in the proper way. And that these men have come, you could say a full circle now, to the point that they have received it, and he said they have kept thy word. So in other words, what God had given to him, Jesus more looks at himself as more of a steward. A steward is one who's entrusted with the affairs or concerns of another. In other words, it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to them, but I'm going to take care of it. But God tells his son, no, I gave it to you. But the son still looks at it. You might have gave it to me. I'm just going to take care of it on your behalf because you and I are yet one. We'll get into that as we get a little bit deeper. But he let them know that what you have given to me, I have done the right thing. I have manifested thy name. And guess what? These individuals you gave me have kept thy word. And there's only one way you can keep God's word. And that's first of all, you have to understand it. But understanding comes through listening. Listening and hearing what it is being said. Because you all know there's a difference between hearing something and listening, right? You know, you can be in your day and I hear some noise outside, but I don't know what's going on. But if you listen, you can understand what's happening. So they have listened and truly have received the word that they have, re have, have received from Christ. It says that I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them, men, I mean, gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 7 says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So in other words, now he gives testimony to these men and their understanding. He says, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast gavest me are of thee. So now they have a, a knowledge of God. They don't just have a, uh, as pastor let's say, a head knowledge. They have true knowledge. Understand that whatever Christ has presented, Christ says that they got it from the Father. So they know now the position that God holds in that with Christ. Christ is basically about to give them testimony once again of who he is and that he is the true Messiah. He is the true Christ himself. And as he goes forth, he says, These things now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. So Jesus is saying one thing. He only done what God called for him to do what? To do. And that is the words that he has given him. Jesus using the words he always used of prophets. I've always said the prophets had an easy job and a hard job at the exact same time. You know, the hard part about that job was, well, the people there to talk to. Can you imagine standing before people or talking to people who cannot stand you? They hate you. They don't want to hear anything that you have to say, anything that you're talking about. They're just so reluctant to resist your word that you say, why am I even speaking to these people? It's kind of like Isaiah said, well, how long should I preach to them? And, 
And the Lord said, you preach to them until they are taken into captivity. Therefore, they will have no excuse that they have not heard my word. But yet you'll find there's a hard thing speaking to people that don't hear what you have to say. Now, how was it easy? I explained it for you. How, how was it easy for the prophets? It's hard to speak to the people, but what made it easy? God was with them, but as Bush said, God gave them the word. In other words, it's kind of like, and I've used this example before. Right now, if I was to ask somebody to come up here and do a presentation on the next scripture, would it be hard? Hmm? Well, suppose before you came up, I gave you the words and broke it down to you. Would it be hard then? Yeah, more understanding. So my point is this. When they went forth to preach the word, they didn't have to worry about what they had to say. Because where did the word come from? God already gave them what it is that they had to present. With the prophets, whenever they came to give forth any prophecy or whatever, God would always tell them what to say. Because keep in mind, what, what was their always statement when they started out? They always said, thus saith the Lord. They didn't say, this is what I have to say to you today. They said, thus saith the Lord. And Jesus says in his statement, he says, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. In other words, you gave me the words, and all I did was present it. I even said in certain circles that even pre presenting of a, of a scripture or teaching, in some cases, not that hard. Because all you're doing is reading off the page and then explain it. So it's not totally hard because you're not going in blind. It's not me, the, um, the, the rapper um, Little Wayne. You know, in school, he, he's supposed to be real smart. They said, like a straight-A student. And I was amazed at one of the interview he did, and he said, yeah, I did pretty good in school. I was on a roll the whole time. But, you know, people stereotype you, like, yeah, right. But the teacher said, yeah, he was smart. And he said, well, I didn't see nothing hard about school. They told us tests coming out of Chapter 5, read Chapter 5. I read the chapter, and the test was on Chapter 5. He said, what was hard about it? He said, I always ace things in school. So what he's saying is this, the words were already given to me. The answer was right before me. So Jesus says here, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And then he says, and they have received them. So in other words, they acknowledge it, they receive it, now they know it to be truth. They have truly received it. So which meant they had to what? Listen to what was being presented. But then when they listen, they fully and totally accept what was presented to them. He said, and they have known surely, he said, that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. In that statement, what are they now believing about Christ? He's the Son of God. You know, he doesn't come out right and say that, guess what, I am the Messiah. But they know now that, guess what, God's the one that sent him. They know he came from Christ, I mean, came from God, and all things were given to him by God. So he let them know here that he is the Christ himself. I always say throughout the Bible, when you look, you always see, even in these words, what we call the plan of salvation. Doesn't have to come from one section. Wherever Jesus is presenting himself and saying who he is and how you can be saved, that's the plan of salvation. He's saying here once again in verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I could ask one of you today, do you believe that statement? And what will you say? Then you're now saved, because you believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's all he's saying here is just that. Thou give me, you believe this. He says, I pray for them. When somebody's praying on your behalf, what's that called? Do we like intercessory prayer? I hope you do. I've always come and said many times, I remember Wallace said you one time, well, I'm glad somebody's praying for us, because we wouldn't be where we are today if somebody wasn't, because sometimes we don't have enough sense to pray for ourselves. And it's always good when somebody prays for you. All the time they pray for you, you don't even have any idea, any knowledge of understanding of the intercessory prayer. There are people here today in this church we probably give prayer for that they won't be here. That's called that intercessory prayer. You're praying on their behalf. You're helping lifting them up. And Jesus is now praying for his men. And what is one of the reasons why Jesus might be praying for his men this morning? Considering, look at the backdrop of what's going on here. Helen and then Dick Bush. Yep, soon he'll be gone, Ding Bush. Mm hmm Exactly. In other words, he knows that his time is drawing near. And then to this point, he has been there. I guess you could say take all the blows for his men, but he's going to be gone. And now they got to deal with a whole lot. And they no longer has his physical presence amongst them. And you know how people are, we are, we are visual. 
We have to see something before us. But he's building our faith up there and understand that the Holy the Comforter is coming, but I no longer will walk physically with you. So he says, I'm, I'm praying for you because you're going to go through some things, some, some serious issues and concerns that will come up. He said, I pray for them. But here's another one. He says, I pray not for the world. Uh-oh. What does he mean there? Now, give you a little hint. You have to look at this text and read all of it. You follow me? Sometimes people will show you stuff like this and will stop. That's proof texting in the wrong way. You know, there's a right way to proof text and there's a wrong way to proof text. All right, proof text, the wrong way to proof text is when you read a particular scripture to show what it is you are saying. That's wrong. Now, if you listen to the words, I might have threw you there. When you take a scripture and you try to show what it is that you are saying, then guess what? That's wrong with the proof text. The right way to proof text is you take a scripture and show what God is saying. That is the right way. Do y'all get the difference? One way, man trying to prove what he want to prove, but you can't present it man what you want to prove. You got to prove what it is that God wants to prove. But someone look at it here. Well, he said here, I pray for them, but I pray not for the world. That ain't the Christian thought. That ain't the Christian mindset. That don't sound right by Christ. But to get ahead of ourselves, what is he speaking of here? Or what do you think? When he says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. What's your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Good statement. And that's true. You know, because you keep in mind, Jesus' desire was that how many would be saved? That all would be saved. But he knew would all be saved? Not all would be saved. He said, I come that all might be saved. That, but they would hear the word and receive the word. But also that praying not for the world too is a play on, you could say almost to the physical structure. You know, people say, I'm going to pray for the church. Well, you might say, you can pray for the church, but I hope you pray for the people. You know, like they say, I pray for this country. You can pray for the country, but I hope you're praying for the people. You know, the physical structure doesn't mean a thing. The true church is who? It's the people themselves. So he let you know that I'm not here praying for this world system. But keep in mind, when he's praying too, at this point he is praying for his men and his, and his people and his believers. That's truly who he is praying for at this time. Because what about prayer? It's always good to make your prayer specific. You know, you don't want to pray all over the place. If you got a certain request, make it known. You know, it's like when you would bug your parents about something. They would say, boy, say what you want or say what you mean. You, you all over the place. I don't know what you're talking about. You make it clear what your, what your desire is. And here Christ said he makes a prayer, but he makes it for who? For his men. He said, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. He said, for they are thine. You see in there how he spins it back to God? But who did God give it to? Remember that beginning? Who did he give, it to, give these men to? Well, who did God give them to? He gave them to Jesus, but Jesus said, who, who are they? He said, they're yours. But God said, I gave them to him. But once again, Jesus looks at more of their being one. Remember, he always said that thought not robbery to call himself equal unto God. And here you say, you might have gave them to me, but they still are yours. You know, because they're bringing forth your name. He said, for they are yours. Verse 10 says, and all mine are thine, and thou art mine, and I am glorified in them. We get a saying from that, don't we, today, that we use, don't we? What's the saying? Anybody know what I'm speaking of? Yeah, but do we say that? I know what Doc Hayes always used to say. Doc Hayes just said, people say, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. Doc Hayes would tell you, that's what man thinks quick. Mm -hmm. Digging bush. <laughs> I'm glad you're sitting by that door. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what he's saying, that I'm one. He said, and all mine are thine, and thou art mine, and I am glorified in them. This is why he uses the phrase back and forth, God, you have gave them to me, but they're still yours. And then he goes back that they are mine, but yet in reality they are yours. In other words, they are one. What he deals with here is the church folks also showing here at the Trinity, the church should be in what? As far as together, in unity. That's all he's speaking of, in unity. Remember our earlier lessons dealt with how we are many members, but how many bodies? One body working in unit, one with another. And that's one of the hardest concepts that you can have in life, but especially in the church. Sorry, folks, but everybody working together. That's a hard thing to do sometimes. Everybody working together. Because in the end, we're trying to achieve what kind of goal? The same goal. 
just we might have different ways of going about it. I've always said before that the end goal is very important, but what role do you take to get there? Somebody said, well, I'm going to the hit the sheets. And they said, well, you can go to sheets, but I would go up here and turn left on Lewistown, go up, turn around on Lake Ridge, hit Route 1 and go that way. Another said, well, I would say just go straight through Ashgate all the way through and you'll get the sheets on Route 1. You might have took a different route, but we all ended up where? At the same place. But it takes us truly working in unity together. So that's why you always have to focus upon what is the purpose here? What is our end goal? And come together as one to bring about unity. And Jesus is teaching his disciples this now because why? He's getting ready to go. And they're going to need guidance. They're going to need understanding to go in the right direction. And Jesus never asked anyone to do something that he wouldn't do what? First. And he always led them. They said that they have to take that leadership role. And it says, now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. So now what is he saying, folks? He said, now I am no more in the world. What is he saying? Hmm? He's about to be gone. Because he knows at this very point, Judas is on his way. With the soldiers, with their sticks, with their swords, with their staves, with their torches, along with the chief priests, and uh, just a mob of people coming to arrest him to have him crucified. So he's letting them know just before they go into the Garden of Gethsemane to give the prayer, he says, Here now, I am no more in the world. In other words, my time has come. He says, But these are in the world. He's now praying, this, the prayer switched from himself to his men. He said, but I'm not going to be here, but guess who's going to be left behind in this world? He said, but these are in the world. So these men never going to need God's help, God's protection, God's guidance. He said, I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So he's calling for them to be as one in unity, together. That is key. You have to stick together. Because is that strength in numbers? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, with Israel... A lot of times folks said that they, they fell because uh, they didn't have God, which is true. They fell because they didn't have God. But also keep in mind, they were a strong nation of people when they were united. But when the kingdom split under Rehoboam, they became weak because now they were no more a united nation. And therefore, they fell because of that instance because it was not in unity one for another. But it goes on to say, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. In other words, he said, when I was here, I protected them. I looked out at them. I washed over them. But as you know, I'm about to, to be called up. So now they are left behind, but yet I didn't lose any but one. He said, the son of perdition. And who is that? Judas. Perdition basically means one who is destined for destruction. He said, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, I've used it before. I always like to use it just to cause a debate when you leave here. Was Judas predestined to betray Christ? Bush, no, I go, he probably remember, I remember me using this. So you keep quiet. <laughs> was Judas destined, predestined to betray Christ? Um, yes. I hear yes, yes. I hear no. Usually you hear that yes, he was. Mm -hmm, that he was predestined. I always say, well, if he was placed here to betray Christ, what kind of reward did God give him in heaven? Now y'all really think, like, what the world is he talking about? Wait a minute. You, you, you just said that he was predestined to betray Christ. So by his actions, he brought about really your salvation because he carried out the scriptures. But you're saying he's going to hell. He, he killed us. I mean, he set it up. He, he set it up and God put him in place to do that. Y'all okay. right. get me? Right. Got you scratching your head now, am I? <laughs> what I'm saying is, if he was born for this very purpose, that he came along, he was ordained like the rest of them, because Jesus said he went to the mountaintop and he prayed all that night. Early that morning he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, he who ordained to be his apostles, which one of them was who? Judas. Judas was the treasurer of the group. Judas got all the teaching they received. Judas, according to uh, prophecy, betrayed him. Judas went and got these soldiers. 
Jesus brought him forth. They arrested Christ. He betrayed him. How? And they said, which one is supposed to be Jesus? How will we know? He gave him a kiss on the cheek. And they said, this is the one. Then they took him. They gave him the mock trial. You know, the beatings, the whippings and all. And carried his own cross up Golgotha's hill. Hung up on that cross. And then he died and went to the ground. And all this by the man who was predestined to do this. Fulfilled scriptures to its full extent. Crossed every T and dotted every I. Did what was ordained by him. By the holy God ourselves. And then you're saying, God said to him, now you're going straight to hell for what it is you did. But yet you set me up. Make you scratch your head on that one, don't it? So, so my point is, he wasn't predestined. Oh, it would have happened some kind of way through someone, but it did not have to be Judas himself. But scripture said he would be betrayed. But it didn't necessarily just have to be Judas himself. It could have been anyone. In fact, we don't have time to go into it and go to Scripture where Jesus even gave him an idea like you might want to turn away from what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. But he was called the son of perdition, one who was destined here now for his actions to that of damnation itself. But when it comes to that predestination part, I always throw it out to get people scratch their head like, I never thought of it that way before. Mm -hmm. So some people even say, well, if you look at it that way, well, if it weren't for Judas, we might not got our salvation. I'm like, yeah, but you know, that's totally wrong. But think Bush... Three times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But when it comes to forgiveness, is all sin forgiven? All except for one. And what is that one? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Like all sins can be forgiven. Give another example. You talk about things that are done. Who probably killed more Christians than anybody? A man by the name of Paul. And Paul would tell you each time he stood before you, he would give his testimony that I persecuted Christians. I went into different regions, had them arrested. I had people locked up. I was consenting unto their death. I even spoke against them while they were even being killed. He killed many people. I went to number of maybe, but many people. But in reality, he says, that was then, the things I did uh, through ignorance. But it, to use a play on words, he said, but look at me now. Look at what God has done for me and forgiven me and caused me to go forth. And then he would start preaching to them, guess what? Jesus Christ. Because he said, if I can be forgiven for what it is I did, surely you can also be forgiven. But here you'll find he's calling for unity among the believers in Christ. As Christ's name is about to go on, he said, we have to have unity among you 12. This is one of the reasons, too, why... You know, when Jesus asked his disciples this question, he says, who do the world say that I am? Remember that? And who did they say he was? Who did the world say he was? Oh, they called him great prophet, Moses, Elijah, come back. They were all over the place. But he says, but who do you say that I am? Now, we're not worried about that answer at this point, but why did he ask them that question? Right. They needed to know. Because you think about it, if these 12 are going to carry forth the ministry after Christ leaves, and one of them saying this, one of them saying this, one of them saying that, where would the gospel be today? It'd be total confusion. But they had to be of one of mind and one accord with the understanding of who he was. And here he's still giving us here now, we call it, as our theme was, a teaching session. He's teaching all he can before he goes on. And as I fly through these next verses, as our time is running out, he says, verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He says, and now come I to thee, these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them, because they, have not, uh, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He let them know that, guess what? Jesus did everything right, didn't he? All he did was talk peace, love, understanding, heal people. You know, the list goes on and on and on. But how did the world at large feel about him? They hated him. You know, that's a whole other story to get into. But he said here, they hated me. So guess what? Oh, they're going to hate you also. Because keep in mind, one thing that's often lost in the scriptures when they crucified Jesus, their words were this, where are those that were with him? That's why the disciples now were locked away in the upper room. Because they wanted to, be, they wanted to kill them next. 
So you let know what they had to come upon. He says, I have given them thy word and the world have hated them because they are not of the world, even as not, a, not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. In other words, you protect them, but you don't want to take them out of the world. In other words, they have to stay. It's kind of like, I'll give you a quick example, Paul. You remember Paul wanted to go. What I mean go, he said, die. Not that he was, I'm tired of this. He says, it is better for me to now go on and be with the Lord. And this is my desire. He said, but I have need to be here because many people need to be saved. So I have to stay back now and save as many as I can and not think about self. And Jesus said now with his men, it's not time to take them out of the world, but they have to stay in this world, but yet protect them from the evil that's coming upon them. Because he says in verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And our last four verses say, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify means to be set apart for a holy purpose. He said, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through the word. Remember, this prayer had three phases. First, he prayed for who? Secondly, he prayed for who? And now he's praying for who? Everybody else said, didn't we say earlier, to the believers. He said, as far as the world goes, saw it, he said, I'm not praying for the world at this point. I'm only praying for those who are believers in me because I have brought forth the word and they have had the opportunity to receive, but it's their choice whether to receive or not. That's why he said earlier, I prayed not for the world, but here he says, verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And keep in mind, when the Bible's written and the events is written at a particular time, a particular point for a particular people at that time, but also it resonates even in today's world. Because with this one, he says here, neither pray I for thee alone, but also them also which shall believe on me through the word. They say that it speaks to future folks who will believe on him, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In other words, his disciples now are believers, but now it's their job to spread the word to also have others understand and believe on him also. Now that ended our spring quarter. Spring quarter is done. Wallace, if you don't mind, spring quarter is done. Now we are moving into our summer quarter series of lessons. And once again, this quarter starts off with the overall theme is that Jesus proclaims the kingdom. Our first four lessons deals with understanding God's kingdom. Because when you speak of a kingdom, you have to understand what the kingdom truly is all about. And all these lessons are coming out of the synoptic gospels. And what are the synoptic gospels? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you add John into it, what's this called? Full gospels. When you add the gospel according to John. They only call the synoptic gospel because they are similar in style and context of writing. Otherwise, you could say each one is saying the same thing but they may say it a little bit differently or one may make it clear or one may add to what the other one has said. But you have to tie all three together to get the full understanding, once again, what the kingdom is all about. This is why it starts off with the theme for the first four lessons is understanding God's kingdom. And you have to understand it by putting all those gospels um, themselves together. But that ends, the, once again, the spring quarter. Now, once again, um, We'll be out of town again this coming weekend. As of right now, Sunday school will be Thursday again at 7 o'clock. Unless um, things change where my diggers might say they volunteer to teach. If they do, great. If not, I will do it on Thursday night. I hope that everyone will be tuning in or logging in Thursday night, not like last Thursday. You know, I know we have things to do uh, and people are busy. But we will have the class session as of right now. We're going for Thursday at 7 o'clock. And it's very important to, to watch this one. And why? All of them are important, but why, why this one? It's the first one. It set the stages for where the lesson is going to go from here. So if you miss the opening, you may miss a lot of what the lessons are truly all about. It's kind of like when you're watching those movies that have um, what's called a series of them, and you come in at episode three, and you're trying to figure out what's going on because you missed the first two. So it's very important to catch the first night of our lessons. But with that being said, and the hour is at hand, uh, for closing out, I've gone a little bit over. Shall we rise to our feet? 
And Dick and Hall, if you will, give us a closing word of prayer.